as nearly as I can tell, in order to be a liberal, you have to believe that the AIDS virus is spread by lack of funding. <laughs> <laughs> to be a liberal, you have to believe that gender roles are artificial, but being gay is natural. You have to believe that businesses create oppression and governments create prosperity. <laughs> you have to believe that there was no art before federal funding. Oh. <laughs> you have to believe that taxes are too low, but ATM fees are too high. <laughs> you have to believe that secondhand smoke is more dangerous than HIV. You have to believe that the only reason socialism hasn't worked anywhere it's been tried is because the right people haven't been in charge yet. <laughs> but this time, if you elect me as dictator, it'll work. <laughs> More pertinent to our discussion today, you have to believe that gold is an ancient barbarous relic which should be expunged from monetary considerations. And that is the view of the mainstream economics. Now Mises was a gold standard advocate and there are so many fairy tales abounding with regard to the gold standard that I'd like to begin with a fairy tale here. Only this one has more than a kernel of truth. Well, once upon a time, all fairy tales have to start that way, long, long ago in a faraway land there was no trade. Everything people consumed they produced themselves. You guys missed all the good jokes, haha. -ha. <laughs> <laughs> Everything people consume, they produce themselves. Food, clothing, shelter, entertainment, makeup, medicine, paper, everything. Shoes, repair services. There was no outsourcing. Self-sufficiency was attained. This is what the anti-globalists are so happy about. It's as if there was a tariff wall around each individual. 100% tariff or a million percent tariff. Naturally, people were very poor. How can you be rich when you're a master of no trade and a jack of all trades? Then some genius, some Ludwig von Mises or Henry Hazlitt or Murray Rothbard of his day had a great idea. He would specialize in the production of just one thing. He'd learn more about the task. He could innovate. He would engage in a division of labor. He would perfect his skills. This is reasonable. You can't become a good concert pianist or a surgeon unless you do that all day, every day. Unless you practice your craft and practice a lot and intensively, you don't get really good. There's this joke um, in New York City. Someone asks for directions. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? And the answer is practice. <laughs> There's one exception I would make, uh, the, the crits. Anyone know what the crits are? These are the critical legal studies professors at Harvard, Marxist professors. And they had this idea that it's uh, uh, too authoritarian for them to be professors and the uh, cleaning staff uh, mop the floor. And what they should do is switch around, you know, let the, the janitors teach the law classes and let those, <laughs> let those guys sweep the floors. And there I think that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, with that, you see, I'm a moderate. I'm not an extremist. <laughs> I'm willing to uh, allow for uh, non-specialization in certain cases. There's only one problem, to get back to reality here, reality of the fairy tale, there's only one problem. If you specialize in any one thing, it'll pile up. If I make shoes, and all I do all day is make shoes, and I make shoes very well, I'll just have tons of shoes. And if you make uh, t-shirts, you'll just have a lot of t-shirts. So it is imperative if we're going to have specialization and a division of labor and productivity growth and high tech and life itself that we have trade. Because if we don't have trade, uh, you can't eat shoes, you can't eat violins or whatever else it is that you're making. The problem though with this fairy tale so far, notice we haven't introduced money, is this thing called the double coincidence of wants. Suppose I have a chicken and I want a pickle. I have to find a pickle-owning chicken wanter, <laughs> which is tough. <laughs> the other guy has to find a chicken-owning pickle wanter, which is very tough. So what you do 
is you do indirect trade. The odds of I have the chicken, I want somebody who has a pickle and wants a chicken, I'm not going to find someone like that. It's just too tough. So what I'll do with my chicken is I'll trade my chicken into something that I know everyone else will accept. Acceptability or the expectations of acceptability is the key to money. So if I can pick on something that I know everyone will accept, maybe salt or sugar or fish hooks or something like that, then I could take the salt or the sugar and the fish hooks and buy with them the pickle that I really wanted. So it's sort of roundabout. Instead of a direct trade, a direct barter, first I go get this, which I didn't really want, and then I take this and I go get the pickle that I wanted. And it was found that this is a much better way of facilitating exchange than if you try to do it in one fell swoop. Interestingly, as salt or sugar or fish hooks started to be used for this purpose, the demand curve for them shifted to the right because originally you had, say, a supply and a demand of, uh, call, it, call it salt, and the purpose of this demand was just salt to eat or to salt fish or whatever it was. But now you have an additional demand for salt. Here's the demand for salt as a commodity, and here's the demand for salt as a, a mediator of exchange. So the salt became more valuable because more people wanted it, and the supply of it was invariant, at least with regard to this change. Many items were used to intermediate trade. Salt, sugar, tobacco, fish hooks, cows, cigarettes, in a prison of war camp, brass, copper, silver, gold. Bananas never were <laughs> because they go bad after a few days. So, you know, you might, if you traded in your chicken for a banana, by the time you found someone who had a pickle and wanted a banana, you had a rotten banana. It wouldn't be a good facilitator of exchange. Namely, there was a competition between various commodities as to see which one would intermediate trade and some won out. But notice that the competition was between all commodities. They had intrinsic value apart from the trade. Now, I'm not a Marxist. I don't believe in intrinsic values. I'm an Austrian. I mean, I'm a subjectivist. But intrinsic in the sense that the thing itself had some value in the part of the evaluators. In other words, if you do a chemical analysis of this pen, you'll never find the value of it in the pen. The value of it comes from us. But we evaluated it, and it, the commodity, this could have been money also. The key to acceptability, the key to moneyness, is the thought that others will later accept it. The reason you will accept this dollar bill if I give it to you for your pen is because you think that someone else will then take it. If you didn't think anyone else would take it, you wouldn't take it from me. So the key is acceptability, and the acceptability stems from the salt because everyone knows you'd accept salt or pickles or sugar or even bananas which wouldn't be a good money, but could be a good money, or rather could be a money, not a good one, but it would be a commodity because it had a value before it became money. So you just can't start de novo right in the middle. You have to ground it in something that people valued beforehand. Okay, so there was this competitive struggle as to which commodity would be money, and pretty much gold always won out. There were copper and, and brass and other things sometimes won out, but, uh, and silver took second place, but the gold standard pretty much won out. So when people such as myself say we favor the gold standard, we don't really favor gold. We just favor whatever it is that the market picks. Since the market always picked it, we use it as a sort of a shorthand. What we could say is we favor a commodity standard, or we favor free enterprise money. We don't. I'm not sure why. Those two could have been uh, good terminology. But somehow, the, the way the language goes, it's always called the gold standard. And I see no reason to change that. I think it's innocuous. So the gold standard. But this doesn't mean that we have a fetish for gold. <laughs> you know, this is the way Milton Friedman sees us, gold bugs. You know, one of my favorite cartoon characters was Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> and what Scrooge would do is he would get into his money bin and he'd sort of throw the money and it would, you know, he'd go, ah. You know? <laughs> well, you know, don't try it unless, you know, don't knock it until you've tried it, you perverts. You're into other things, you know. This isn't that bad. I mean, I'm sure there are worse perversions, but uh, 
But I personally am innocent of this particular perversion. I have others. Gold isn't one of my perversions. <laughs> it could be a, a, a thing for some people, but uh, seriously speaking for a moment, I hate to you know, be serious. Um, I'm supposed to be telling jokes all the time, but just one little serious point here, that this is a falsity. We're, we're not uh, advocates of gold standards. are not doing it out of uh, you know, weird uh, sexual purposes or anything like that. <laughs> it's just because we think that the market... Whenever it was free to choose, the title of a Friedman book, free to choose, it always chose that. That's all it means. Okay, so why a gold standard? Why did gold win out? Well, it's malleable. It, you, you don't have to be real strong to bend it, like iron and steel, or you, know, you can't move it. It's easy to cut into it. It's cheaply divisible. Diamonds would make a horrible money because, first of all, they are too hard to break up or very hard to break up. And secondly, when you break them up, they lose, I think it's three quarters of their value. If you break a big diamond into two, the two together are worth one quarter of what the bigger one was worth. So you lose three quarters every time you make change. That's not a, a good way to... <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're not going to win the competition if you do that. Uh, it's low-cost transit. The reason cement, even a malleable cement, couldn't be money is it's not worth that much. So you take a whole truckload of cement to buy, uh, you know, to buy this pen. Uh, it's not going to, it's not going to do well. So uh, gold only uh, not only has uh, a high unit, uh, it also has a high value per cubic. You know, like a pillow couldn't be a good money because, or feathers because it's just too much cubic to transport, even though it's light. So uh, what are the advantages of the gold standard? Well, first of all, there are checks and balances. Uh, nobody's printing it up. You can't add a zero to a gold ounce and you know, uh, have inflation that way. It's, it's external to government. Government can't get involved in it easily. Um, so these are some of the advantages of gold. Uh, the reason that governments don't like the gold standard is because they can't inflate. There are three ways that government can get money. One, it could tax. But when it taxes, everyone knows who's doing the tax, and they can't blame it on someone else. The other is borrowing. When they borrow, everyone knows who is borrowing. And, and, and if they're crowding out private borrowing and investment, everyone knows it's government. The third one is inflation, and that is hard to see. There used to be this... Um, movie, a TV show when I was a kid, T-Men, T as in Thomas, T-Men, Treasury Men, and it would show these guys um, at the beginning of the hour, they'd be on the Treasury uh, in Washington, the Treasury building, and they'd march down the stairs to go and catch a counterfeiter or something like that. And what I felt like saying when I realized what was going on when I was a kid, I didn't, I, I felt like saying, well, look, if you want to catch the real counterfeiters, turn around, go back upstairs and grab those guys. Because <laughs> <laughs> those are the ones who are doing this. Um, it's very hard to see that the government is in charge of inflation. Now, we have this thing called the quantity theory of money explanation for inflation. And let me try to go into that for a little bit. Suppose that here is time, and here is the price level. Pardon me for using such an expression in an Austrian gathering, but what the heck. And let's suppose prices were always that way. Oh, before I get into this, I have to try something else on you. Um, we have to introduce expectations. Ordinarily, when we have supply and demand, this demand curve is written on the assumption that the expectations of the future price level will be flat. So I'm putting a line there. In other words, the assumption drawn behind this demand curve is that you expect tomorrow's prices to be the same as today's prices, namely, prices will be flat. Suppose you expected prices to be lower tomorrow. So I put lower on T1. This is uh, T T O. Lower tomorrow. What would that do to the demand curve? What would you do? Buy more or less today if you expect prices to fall tomorrow? Less. You'd buy less. So the demand curve here would be predicated on the expectation of prices falling. <coughs> okay? And obviously if you expected 
prices to rise tomorrow, right? This would be price rise. This would be price flat. You would buy more today because you expect the price to rise tomorrow. Okay. So here we are. We've had prices flat all the time. We were on a gold standard and there was never any inflation, no government. Everything was hunky-dory. And what happens is that the government increases the money supply. So in stage one, the government increases the money supply. And when there are more dollars chasing around the same number of goods, we would expect the prices to rise. Right? Prices start to rise. But we have the expectation, so in other words, prices start to rise. But we have the expectation ingrained in us that prices are always the same. In other words, there was always a little variation before. It was never totally flat. But the overall expectation is that when prices rise, they're going to come down. So we expect prices to fall. And we shift our demand curves down to the left or shift them leftward. And what does that do to prices? It pushes them down. You get it? So initially, the money supply increases, but it leads to flat prices. And people say, well, the monetary theory, the quantity of money theory of, uh, of inflation must be wrong. Because look, here we have evidence to refute it. We increased the money. Did we increase the money? Yes, we increased the money. Did prices rise? No, prices didn't rise. Therefore, ergo, there's no connection. So we say, we, the government, say, hot diggity dog. <laughs> let's put some more zeros. Let's slap some more ink on paper and start spending this because no one will blame us. And it doesn't even cause inflation. Even if it caused inflation, we could always blame it on greedy businessmen or greedy unionists. Now, there's nobody who takes uh, a place ahead of me in denigrating unions. But I'm not a cost-push inflation type person, so I don't believe that unions create inflation. If they raise wages, something else will fall if the money supply is, is flat. Okay, so here we have a, a supposed refutation. Then in stage two, what happens is we keep raising money bigger and bigger, and eventually prices rise a little bit and then more and more and then proportionally and here's the evidence in favor of the monetary theory. But now in stage three we, we cut back on money increases. It's moderate now but people now have an expectation of inflation. Now we're up here somewhere and now we move into this diagram. They expect prices higher tomorrow than today. So they buy more today, right? because they expect prices to rise tomorrow. They take advantage of today's relative bargains. Well, now you have a situation where the money supply is even maybe flat or just moderate, and now price rises are very high. And again, we refute the theory. Then you can get up into the crack, crack up uh, inflationary boom, and, and they might even decrease the money supply, and yet prices keep rising. So it's a complicated relationship that's mediated by expectations. It's not a mechanical one-to-one -one thing. So the econometric result, unless they get the lags right, namely they fudge it, uh, are not oh, only here will, they, will the, the econometric evidence support the theory. And yet we think that the theory is correct on praxeological grounds. Okay. Did the gold standard collapse? No. The government abolished it, in effect, to make inflation easy. We never really had a full gold standard for any long um, amount of time. Okay, the fairy tale continued. How then did inflation start without government? We're still back in the fairy tale. We're, I introduced government for a moment. I'm erasing government. You have to cheer now. Yay, we erase government. <laughs> okay, and now... Uh, how did inflation start? Well, there was a pure gold standard, at least in our imaginations. And people were in the habit of uh, leaving their extra stores of gold in the care of the goldsmith. Why the goldsmith? Because he had the biggest, strongest safe in town. And gold was valuable, and you don't want to leave a whole ton of it around in the basement, so you leave it to the, uh, the goldsmith or the bank or somebody who's got a strong safe and a reputation for reliability. Well, one day the goldsmith realized that a lot of people in town stored gold with him, and what he would do is give them warehouse receipts for the gold, 
you give the goldsmith 10 ounces of gold, it gives you a receipt for 10 ounces of gold. Then every time you want to buy something, you go back to him and say, okay, give me back my 10 gold ounces. And he gives them back and then you go spend it. And then people got lazy or efficient. And they said, look, why should I go give, why should I go give the gold, uh, uh, give the warehouse receipt back and get the gold and then spend the gold? I'll just give my grocer or my plumber a warehouse receipt for gold. And he knows, he also has his own money in the goldsmith's safe. He knows that this is a legitimate thing. He recognizes the goldsmith's signature. And he'll accept this gold piece of paper for, um, for the groceries. So these uh, certificates or warehouse receipts for gold then started to be traded as money. Because remember, our definition of money is that which facilitates, intermediates trade. And it used to be gold, but now it's just pieces of paper 100% backed by gold, namely warehouse receipts for gold. Okay, so everything was fine until the evil wife of the goldsmith said she wanted a new fur coat <laughs> or a new chariot or something. And now the goldsmith um, got this wonderful idea. He said, you know, I've got a thousand ounces of gold in my um, uh, safe and I've got a thousand ounces of warehouse receipts circulating out there. But no one, it never will happen or it never has happened in a million years that everyone suddenly comes with their warehouse receipts and they all demand their gold. Rather, this one gives the receipt to that one and that one gives the receipt for this one and the stuff circulates. Every once in a while they're going on a trip to a foreign country where the warehouse receipts will not circulate because they don't know me so they come in and they get their gold but if they do someone else will deposit gold. So by and large, you know, the, it's a thousand and a thousand and it sort of fluctuates but it's stable. So he comes up with this genius idea, you get the light bulb over his head, he says, look, I'll print up another 200 ounces of receipts or another receipts for another 200 ounces of gold that doesn't exist, just receipts, and no one will know and I'll go out and I'll buy the fur coat or I'll buy the coach for my wife, she'll, you know, get off of my case, and, um, <laughs> and fractional reserve banking was born, and inflation was born, now we have this um, extra money chasing certain amount of goods. So with gold at 100% back, there are no balance of payments problems, there's no competing devaluation, no protection, or at least the impetus from the money side. There's still protectionism, the impetus from people who don't understand comparative advantage, but that's a different issue. The entire world economy would be integrated if we had a pure gold standard. It'd be like one country with one currency. And it's no accident that the world history or world economic history most closely, not perfectly, but most closely approximated this from 1815 and 1914, which was the century of the gold standard and also the century of peace, because peace is not unrelated to economics. If you have competing devaluations, you have more warlike impetus, and if you have uh, peaceful economic relations, less. Okay, so the Rothbardian, Necessian, radical proposal for free market money has the following constituent elements. No legal tender laws. Legal tender laws are say, say that you must accept this money. That's, that's a, a compulsion. That's a coercion. That's not part of free enterprise money. There would be 100% reserves, no fractional reserve banking. There would be the denationalization of fiat currency. It would all be converted into gold or gold-backed money. The abolition of the Fed. No 3% rule that Friedman wants, you know, uh, Friedman doesn't trust the Fed and he wants to handcuff them with a 3% rule. They can only increase money supply by 3% because he thinks that um, productivity will increase by 3% and therefore the price level will be the same. These Chicagoites love the price level to be constant. There would be private coinage. If you want to make a coin out of copper or something, you, you go to the you know, the Acme Jones Coin Company, you don't uh, give that to the government. Uh, there would be a separation of money and state, just like there's a separation, supposedly a separation of religion and state, and there should be a, a separation of schooling and state, there would now be a separation of money and state. There would be a return of the gold, government gold hoards to private hands, uh, there would be no government monopoly in the supply of money, Mining, minting, certification, storage of money would all be done privately. 
you know, my rule is if it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't, privatize it. And since everything either moves or doesn't, you privatize it. Well, money also follows in, into this category. It'd be an honest to goodness gold standard in which 100% of the money literally consisted of gold or gold substitutes or warehouses for gold. So that would be the ideal. One benefit of this would be that there would be no inflation. And inflation is a serious sort of a thing. Uh, most economic historians, military historians, attribute World War II to the rise of Hitler and attribute the rise of Hitler to the uh, inflationary boom of the 20s in Germany where people would take wheelbarrows full of money to buy a loaf of bread and the economy was just totally disrupted and, and a demagogue like Hitler was able to arise there. If we didn't have this, we might not have had World War II and we could have had many, many more millions of very valuable people alive and their children alive. I'm not an overpopulationist. I don't think we should cut down on the number of people. I'm wildly pro-human. I'm against war. Therefore, I'm against inflation because it causes war and it disrupts the economy. So much the Chicagoans would agree with us Austrians. In addition, here's another point that they wouldn't agree with us on, and that is that inflation not only, or rather monetary creation not only creates inflation, but it also artificially reduces the interest rate. And when it artificially reduces the interest rate, what it does is create the Austrian business cycle. And the Austrian business cycle can usually be illustrated with some sort of triangle like that. Well, here is consumption, and here is uh, capital or investments, and the, the lower orders here and the higher orders here. And this triangle is based on time preference rates, the rate at which people regard present dollars with regard to future dollars, which leads into the interest rate. I am an advocate of the pure time preference theory uh, of interest rate determination. So what happens when the government increases the money supply from S to S prime, and here is money, and here is the interest rate, is that the interest get rate gets lower. When the interest rate gets lower, this triangle gets elongated. We have reductions in consumption and increases in long roundabout methods of production. But these long roundabout methods of production are incompatible with the time preference rates. Now, if this is just a once and for all little bout of inflation, all these investments have to be eradicated. Roger Garrison in his book talks about creating nine bricks where you need 10 bricks to complete a project. I think that's a very insightful way of looking at it. You can't complete all these projects that are started. They have to be dissipated. For the Austrians, the boom is the bad stuff, and the recession is the good stuff, because the recession gets rid of these malinvestments that never should have been made in the first place. Okay? Look, to, to get it out of the intertemporal consideration and into the intratemporal, right now, the allocation between pens and wristwatches is good, right? There's no crisis, <laughs> right? I just invented this stuff. There's no newspaper story about how we have too much or too few of these. Now, suppose the government subsidized wristwatches and, government and businessmen started making more wristwatches. But we only want this proportion. Now we've got this proportion. Well, a lot of wristwatch manufacturers are going to go broke and they should be going broke because we didn't need them in the first place. We needed this. So it sounds weird. I mean, everyone says the boom is good and the recession is bad. The Austrians seem to be out of step with everyone else. But my claim is that you don't want more of things indiscriminately. Rather, you want a, a rational allocation of things. And if you've got too many of this and too few of this, and the recession consists of going back this way, well, that's good. Sorry for my confusion of the normative and the positive here, but good in the sense of, of, of efficient. Okay, so the second problem, in addition to inflation, is it creates the business cycle. And the business cycle is, you know, a big pain in the neck, and who wants the business cycle? Uh, under the gold standard, uh, you might have a discovery of gold, and you might have more of an increase in money, but gold is part of the market. Gold does not, uh, uh, discovery of gold does not pervert the time preference rates uh, of the population. Okay, 
so much for our brief look at the Misesian case or the Rothbardian case for the gold standard. Peace, prosperity, no inflation, no artificial creation of the business cycle, all attributable to gold. But it's not enough to show the glorious insights of Mises to appreciate what he's doing. Suppose the entire economics profession agreed with Mises. Then we'd say, okay, Mises, you know, pat him on the head, good guy, you know, <laughs> good scholar. But everyone else does this too, so, you know, why should we single you out for any special accolades? So, you know, fine. So in order to appreciate the beauty, the brilliance of Mises and the gold standard advocates, what we have to do is compare uh, Mises with the economics profession. So let me now look at what the rest of the economics profession thinks of gold and get back to the series of jokes that I tell you about, the barbarous relic, that's what they think of it. But let me um, uh, elaborate upon that. Here is a Newsweek column on something else, completely different story, and it says, uh, here's just sort of a, a phrase, although most economists have long banned mention of gold from their discourse, and then he goes on back to the story. Well, that's so true. Economists have banned discussion of the gold standard. They don't even discuss it. It's not as if they say, well, you know, we have to have a chapter on it to show why it's wrong. That would be the decent thing to do, but no. They just ignore it. Here is another um, thing in the American Economic Review, which is an attempt to study the um, disparateness of belief of economists. And what they do is they ask economists 35 questions, all sorts of questions, and then they try to see how much uh, deviation is there in the views. In other words, some views, 98% of economists will agree. Others, you know, 5% will agree, and everyone disagrees. There are 37 questions, and I've outlined the ones on money. The money supply is a more important target than the interest rates for monetary policy. Cash payments are superior to transfers in kind. Flexible exchange rate offer an effective international monetary arrangement. Inflation is primary a monetary phenomenon. That one got half the, half the vote here. The central bank should be instructed to increase the money supply at a fixed rate. And it goes on and on, about eight more questions on money and then questions on micro and labor and trade and everything else. Guess what they don't even ask about? Gold. Gold is not there. Okay, now, I want to contrast Mises' view on gold with a few people that did discuss it. I don't want to discuss it with Mark, uh, compare with Marxists because that's like shooting fish in a barrel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even want to compare it with Keynesians because Keynesians, again, fish in a barrel. <laughs> what I want to do is to compare the views of gold standard between Mises and Rothbard on the one hand, with four people who are more uh, worthwhile competitors or enemies, intellectual enemies. And the people I've chosen are Milton Friedman, uh, Alan Greenspan, Friedrich Hayek, and Robert Mundell as worthy opponents or worthy comparisons with Mises. These people are members of the Mont Pelerin Society, Free, uh, uh, Friedman and Hayek were at the University of Chicago. All four are conservatives. Greenspan is associated with Ayn Rand. Um, they were all associated with the Reagan administration. Um, uh, Hayek and uh, Greenspan are even Austrians of the offshoot. Remember uh, when Guido gave you the, the, the introductory speech and said, here's the mainstream Austrian uh, from Menger to Bavirk to Mises to Rothbard? Well, here are the other guys sort of our cousins. Uh, they're Austrians, but they're not really uh, fully kosher. <laughs> okay, so let's start off with Friedman. Here is Friedman on money, and here's a quote from Friedman. He says, the classical liberal, that is himself, is suspicious of assigning to government any functions that can be performed through the market both because this substitutes coercion for voluntary cooperation in the area in question, and because by giving government an increased role, it threatens freedom in other areas. This is pretty good stuff. Control over monetary and banking arrangements is a particularly dangerous power to entrust the government because of its far-reaching effects on economic activity at large, as numerous episodes from ancient times to the present and over the whole of the globe tragically demonstrate. 
The idea here is that money touches everything. Whereas if you mess up antitrust, or you mess up labor, or you mess up trade, eh, it's not so bad because it's limited. Whereas money permeates the entire economy, so if you mess up money, you mess up everything. So this is a pretty good quote from Friedman. After reading this, you start, you start saying, well, why doesn't Friedman come and lecture here? You know, why doesn't Lou invite him? Did Lou make a mistake? No, Lou didn't make a mistake. <laughs> because here's another quote from Friedman, one page later in his book, Capitalism and Freedom. And now he's attacking the gold standard. Quote, the fundamental effect of a commodity standard, read gold standard, this is Friedman speaking, from the point of view of society as a whole, that's a problem right there from an Austrian point of view. What's the society as a whole stuff? But let me continue. Is that it requires the use of real resources to add to the stock of money. People must work hard to dig gold out of the ground in South America in order to rebury it in Fort Knox. The necessity of using real resources for the operation of a commodity standard establishes a strong incentive for people to find ways to achieve the same result without employing these resources. If people will accept as money pieces of paper on which it is printed, I promise to pay X units of the commodity standard, these pieces of paper can perform the same function as the physical pieces of gold or silver, and they require very much less in resources to produce. Well, this is a, a, a very different kind of a quote. The first one is, uh, markets are good, voluntary cooperation is better than coercion, the tragic history of government control. This sounds great. The second quote says, if I were to summarize it, is um, um, freedom costs real resources. <laughs> <laughs> Conclusion, don't do it. <laughs> uh, so here we have a ringing declaration for freedom, the first quote, and the second one is, but it costs money, therefore forget it. <laughs> Let's have coercion. Well, that doesn't follow. <laughs> What about justice though the heavens fall? What about our lives, our fortunes, our sacred honors? What about millions for defense, not a penny for tribute? What about kick butt? I mean, <laughs> none of that stuff comes from Friedman's second quote. It's really a, a monumental cop-out. I mean, that first quote was just wonderful. Freedom, government is evil. The second, but it costs money, so forget it. Well, first of all, I don't think it costs money because you'd have to dig it up anyway because gold is a valuable commodity. Uh, and secondly, uh, suppose it did cost resources, isn't the question, is it worth the cost of resources or not? Just because some, look, this pen costs real resources, so should I say forget about pens? I mean, that's roughly what he's saying. This watch costs 10 bucks, therefore I shouldn't have bought it? <laughs> no, I should have bought it if I valued it at more than 10 bucks. Notice it's me evaluating, not society as a whole. So who should do the evaluating? And is gold worth anything? Is it worth anything to have gold? And I would say that yes, it is, because with the gold standard, we can control, we the people can control monetary events in a way that with a government, we can't. Remember, we said that uh, uh, gold was chosen whenever people were free to choose. And you have to ask, why did people choose it? Well, one reason they chose it is that the value of it was not amenable to counterfeiting. By the way, in my book, Defending the Undefendable, I have a chapter favoring counterfeiting. But it's not government counterfeiting, it's private enterprise counterfeiting. <laughs> uh, Bob Murphy, who was here a month ago and who is a buddy of mine, I'm a co-author of his, he's a very good Austrian, he now has an article coming out attacking this and I'm going to reply. It's an interesting point. See what I'm saying is that it's bad to counterfeit legitimate money, but counterfeiting counterfeit money <laughs> is a mitzvah, you know, it's, it's a good thing, right? So um, it's a technical argument and I, I don't really want to get into that here, but maybe in a year from now when his article comes out and my reply comes out, I'll, I'll talk more about that. But I certainly don't favor government counterfeiting legitimate money. So don't interpret that chapter to, to say I do. Throughout history, people have been victimized by fiat currency. Gold is an insurance policy. Insurance policies cost money and yet people buy them. Locks, fences, doors, 
are also cost money. Yet we have bad guys out there who will come in and rob us, so we put locks on our doors. We put chains on our bicycles. The Friedman idea is equivalent to saying, well, look, locks on bicycles cost money, therefore you shouldn't do it. And what I'm saying is, yes, the gold standard costs money, but it's like a lock on a bicycle, and you should do it if you're afraid that they're going to take your bicycle, or you should do it if you're afraid they're going to take not your money, but the value of your money dissipated by inflation. Do you see the point? So I think Friedman is wrong in saying that just because it uses up real resources, which it sort of doesn't really. You'll remember this diagram. I said that the um, here is the demand curve, here is the quantity, and here is the price of money, quantity of money, price of money. Uh, I said that when you started using salt, the value of salt increased because one, this was the value of salt as salt and now it's the money. Well, I agree with Friedman. It will cost some resources because here was the value of gold, just pure gold for teeth and jewelry and now it cre increased the value, so we'll probably mine a little bit more, so it'll cost a little bit more resources. Not the entire cost of gold, but just the cost of gold attributable to the extra value we place on it because it's money. So I agree with him, it'll cost a little extra money. Not very much, just a little. But the question is, just because it costs money doesn't mean it's worth it or not worth it. That you determine based on whether you think it's worth the extra cost. Like you know, like I said, the pen costs money. That doesn't mean we shouldn't, you know, not have pens. Okay, the next guy is Greenspan. Greenspan represents the greatest challenge to the task of contrasting Mises and other prominent economists because, free, because Greenspan is good on gold. He's as good as gold. Here is his contribution to capitalism, the unknown ideal. And it is written as if he was a student of Mises, which he was. And the, uh, the capitalism and the unknown ideal comes from the objectivist. In other words, they took some objectivist articles and stuck it in the book. Well, here are some quotes from Greenspan on gold. Quote, An almost hysterical antagonism toward the gold standard is one issue which unites statists of all persuasions. They seem to sense, perhaps more clearly and subtly than many consistent defenders of laissez-faire, that gold and economic freedom are in inseparable, and that the gold standard is an instrument of laissez-faire, and that each implies and requires the other. That's good stuff. Another quote. But the opposition to the gold standard in any form from a growing number of welfare state advocates was prompted by a much subtler insight, the realization that the gold standard is incompatible with chronic deficit spending, the hallmark of the welfare state. Here's another one. This is the shabby secret of the welfare status tirades against gold. Deficit spending is simply a scheme for the hidden confiscation of wealth. Remember I mentioned the hidden confiscation of wealth? It's easier to see where the taxes and the borrowing are coming than where the inflation is coming from. Um, gold stands in the way of this insidious process. It stands as a protector of property rights. That's the insurance policy against government business. If one grasps this, one has no difficulty in understanding the status antagonism toward the gold standard. One last quote. When gold is accepted as the medium of exchange by most of all nations, an unhampered free international gold standard serves to foster a worldwide division of labor and the broadest international trade. Even though the limits of exchange, the dollar, the pound, the franc, differ from country to country, when all are defined in terms of gold, the economies of the different countries act as one, so long as there are no restraints on trade or the movement of capital." Unquote. This is good stuff. This, I mean, <laughs> this is real good stuff. Uh, Mises or Rothbard or any of the, the, the uh, faculty at the, this seminar, I, I think, would have been proud to write that stuff. That, that's good stuff. How then to account for the fact that Greenspan is head of the Fed, an amazing place for an Austrian necessian to be, and one, the Fed hasn't been disbanded, and two, we're not even on the gold standard, or, or even a move toward the gold standard. Greenspan never mentions the gold standard. He's in charge of fiat currency. How do you account for this? I mean, that's weird. You know, sometimes I have these dreams. This will expose my personality. I, I some, somehow I'd like to be eight foot tall, and then I'll be a star basketball player, and they'll have to interview me on stuff, and I'll say, free enterprise is great. <laughs> <laughs> 
they'll say, wow, look, a basketball star. I think Spree Enterprise is great. That must be, you know, and, and we'll convert everyone. <laughs> Another dream of mine is that I get, I get to be appointed to something like the Department of Labor or the Department of the Fed, and then I disband it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the only thing to do. If somehow you woke up tomorrow and you were the head of the Fed, what you do is you disband it. You know, uh, you get to have, you know, they'll excuse you for being the head of the Fed for a few days, you know, that it takes to disband it. But, but he's been head of the Fed how long? I mean, several administrations, right? It must be 15 years or so? I, 17 years. Uh, so why is he still there? I mean, and he still says that he's a, a ran, ran, well, <laughs> Randian anyway. <laughs> Okay, now Murray Rothbard has an explanation which I think is magnificent. This comes from, I don't know where it comes from, but I didn't make it up, it's, it's here. Uh, it's called Alan Greenspan, a minority report on the new Fed chairman, so it must have been written 16 years ago. And he says, quote, thus Greenspan is only in favor of the gold standard if all conditions are right. If the budget is balanced, trade is free, inflation is licked, everyone has the right philosophy. In the same way, he might say he only favors free trade if all conditions are right. If the budget is balanced, unions are weak, we have a gold standard, the right philosophy. In short, never are one's high philosophical principles applied to one's actions. It becomes almost piquant for the established to have this man in its camp. Over the years, Greenspan has, for example, supported President Ford's imbecilic whip inflation now buttons. Can you imagine, th these are the people in charge of creating inflation, and they give you a button that says, whip inflation now, and that's supposed to stop inflation. <laughs> this is before many of you were born, but believe me, they, they had that stuff. Uh, the old duffers in the front row will, will verify this for me. Uh, much worse is the fact that this high philosophical adherent of laissez-faire saved the racketeering social security program in 1982, just when the general public had begun to realize that the program was bankrupt and there was a good chance of filing, finally slaughtering this sacred cow. Greenspan stepped in as head of a bipartisan uh, commission to save Social Security by raising Social Security taxes, which is wonderful free enterprise stuff. <laughs> so so Murray, Murray's analysis of Greenspan is that he really does believe in laissez-faire, but not in doing anything about it until everything else is laissez-faire which is a recipe for not doing anything about it because <laughs> if all advocates of laissez-faire wouldn't do anything for the system until the system was completed, they wouldn't do anything because <laughs> the, the system would never be completed. So in that way, he can sort of keep his self-respect. He can say, yes, yes, I still am an Ayn Rand adherent. I love laissez-faire. On the other hand, we can't have laissez-faire. So it's, it's sort of a weird thing. Here's a guy who, you read his quotes and he's a gold standard advocate, and you look at his actions and... He's the head of the fiat currency gang. Okay, the next person I want to compare Mises and Rothbard with is Hayek. And in his monograph, Choice in Currency, Hayek specifically opposes, quote, any organized attempt to restore the gold standard. Now that's, that's pretty pathetic. And then people start saying, well, even Hayek. You know, and Hayek leaks all over the place. I had this article in... Um, the Journal of Libertarian Studies, I think, where I analyzed, um, what's that book? Um, Road to Serfdom. You people know my publications better than me. <laughs> you know, the first time I read The Road to Serfdom, it seemed like a great book. And then when I read it, when I had a brain, I mean, he's advocating welfare and uh, he doesn't want to get rid of rent control right away because that would disrupt things. You know, we have to phase it out over 15 years or something. And we have... Uh, it was just a whole, it was sort of a social welfare kind of thing. It's amazing to me that he got this reputation as, as this rabid uh, free enterpriser. In any case, here he's advocating this thing called the Ducat. Now, to be fair to Hayek, it's unclear in his writing whether he's advocating the Ducat, which is a, a, a basket of lira and francs and marks and euros, well, not euros, but because they didn't have them then, but... Uh, other government currencies, whether he's advocating this instead of the gold standard as a temporary measure or that, that he wants this permanently. It's sort of similar to, to Milton Friedman. Is he advocating um, vouchers as a way to bring to full privatization of schools or not? Very unclear. You even ask him directly and 
the answer he gives is unrelated to the question you asked. So he wants um, to get rid of legal tender laws, but as I was saying before, legal tender laws aren't really the problem. The reason the fiat currency that we have in our wallets is accepted as money is because we all expect that it'll be accepted. The legal tender laws are, are sort of like uh, dead letter law. You don't really need them. Okay, so Hayek wants to get rid of them. I agree. Fine, let's get rid of them, but not to have the ducat. This is necessary, but not sufficient. It also runs counter to the Mises regression, Mises Menger regression theorem insight. What's the, the problem here? Well, the problem here is that the value of money depends upon expectations of the value of money, and yet expectations depend upon the value of money. So you think you have some sort of uh, uh, circular reasoning. And uh, the solution to this is that um, each, yes, the dollar today depends upon the value of the dollar yesterday, and the dollar yesterday depends upon the value of the day before. But if you keep going back, back to this never, never land fairy tale I was telling you about before the rise of money, and I don't know if there ever was such a situation, but we can certainly envision one, eventually we get back to gold. So you, don't, you get rid of the circularity that way. The point is that you, you just can't impose a ducat. Now, Murray Rothbard used to uh, uh, illustrate this by saying, well, suppose I printed up 10 Rothbards. Who would accept it as money? No one would. And I was a snotty kid like you then, and I said, oh, I would take one. <laughs> you know, just to ruin his example. <laughs> you know, I would take one and paste it on my window or something because it would be sort of a memorable thing. Ten Rothbards. Who wouldn't want to have ten Rothbards? <laughs> now, now, you go to the uh, local um, uh, burger place. They're not going to take ten Rothbards, but, you know, other libertarians might. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, getting rid of the snottiness about the example, you can see his point. Uh, it has to be grounded in a commodity that has a value so that people will then expect that it'll have a value. Whereas if you just start de novo, start just <coughs> with no basis, no foundation, and say here's a Rothbard or here's a Ducat, we see a Ducat has a value because it's a market basket of other lira and francs and dollars that people expect will be valuable. So it's sort of a way of getting in there, tying this new Ducat to what already exists in people's expectations. It's not like making 10 Rothbards, but, but I don't see how that gets us anywhere how that benefits the free market by making a market basket of, of ducats. So I'm not really a big fan of uh, Hayek on this uh, question. Let me now talk a little bit about Robert Mundell, who is also a Nobel Prize winner. I think all three, three, three out of the four are Nobel Prize winners. The only one that didn't win a Nobel Prize is Greenspan. The other three, Hayek, Friedman, and now Mundell are all Chicago right-wing free enterprise supposedly um, Nobel Prize winners. Okay, so how does Robert Mundell fit into this picture? Robert Mundell has this theory, the optimal currency area. And the optimal currency area, a geographical area, is not the whole world. See, the gold standard people have an optimal currency area, and they, the whole world should be run by the gold standard, and that's it. He has some sort of different theory. Um, What's his theory? Well, his theory, you have to get into Keynesianism now because he's sort of a right-wing Keynesian. Initially, we have a full employment and balance of payments equilibrium between two countries, A and B. Now you have a shift in demand from country B to country A. This causes unemployment in B and inflation in A. Notice this is Keynesian because, I mean, if you have unemployment, you lower wages, you don't have unemployment. You have inflation, you stop printing money. But forget about that. We're in the Keynesian world. So there's a flow of funds from B to A. B is in balance of payment deficit. A is in balance of payment surplus. To correct B's unemployment, you have to increase the money supply. That's the Keynesian monetarist view. But this would aggregate inflation in A, so you have to have lowering of money supply in country A. Or best of all, a fall in the value of B's currency vis-a-vis -vis A's currency. No problem. Macro, money, uh, fine-tuning, flexible exchange rates to the rescue. Forget about all, forget about the problems with Keynes, forget about inflationary recession. This is wonderful if it's two countries because each country can then have its own internal um, uh, policies.
But now suppose that the, um, we're talking just about the U.S. and we divide the countries into East and West. And suppose that there's a shift in demand, not from one country to another, but from goods produced in the West to produ goods produced in the East. Then there's unemployment in the West, inflation in the East. There's a flow of bank reserves from West to East. There's in the West a, a balance of payments deficit, in the East a balance of payments surplus. To correct this unemployment in the West, you have to have increased money supply. And, but this just exacerbates inflation in the East, so there's no solution. Macro money fine-tuning can't work. So what do you do? You have a currency in the West and then a currency in the East. And you have a separate money macro policy here and a separate money macro policy here, and everything is cool. Now Keynesianism rides to the rescue. That's his idea. We can solve the problem only if the currency fits the region. The West and the East should each have their own currency. Well, there's a lot wrong here. First of all, how do you define a region? He defines a region as the place within which there is factor mobility and outside of which there is no factor mobility. But if you uh, define a region like this, the region continually changes as relative prices change. So what do you do? You keep shifting currencies? That's a recipe for disaster. I mean, you need some sort of solidity. That you reach in your wallet, you have a currency. You don't want to have 10 different currencies and, and make trades and stuff. Uh, on the, in another sense, government is the only source of factor mo immobility. In a free enterprise society, there is no factor immobility. So the region is the entire Earth, so we, the optimal currency area is the entire world, despite Mundell. On the other end of the spectrum, it's possible to define each person as a region. But then you would have five or six billion currencies, one for each person. And you'll know that if each person had their own currency, we'd be back in our fairy tale of barter, right? And we'd have the double coincidence of wants, you know, you're not going to accept my dollar, I'm not going to accept your dollar. We'll have to, if I want the chicken and the pickle, and, but I went through that already. So that's no good. <laughs> so how does Mundell, he sees this problem, how does he answer it? Cost-benefit analysis. He goes through a cost-benefit analysis, which Austrians can't do because for us cost is subjective. They are the alternative options foregone but he can see through our heads into what our true costs are. <laughs> when he does this, he never says, well, how many currencies would be optimal, but reading in between the lines, it's not five billion and it's not one. It's, I don't know, maybe a dozen, a dozen currencies for the whole world. But the whole thing is predicated on monetary and fiscal stability based on um, central planning and all, so we reject that with the best will in the world on the part of the planners. And the public choice school has taught us that we can't always accept the best will on the part of politicians. This is an amazing discovery. <laughs> <laughs> Another implication is that Murray is wrong. Murray Rothbard who said that uh, reductio is, what Murray used to say is that reductio is ad absurdum are possible. And, and his example was, no one worries about balance of payments difficulties between New York and New Jersey. He used to say that. And now Mundell has refuted him. <laughs> Mundell worries about balance of payments between New York and New Jersey. I mean, it's the, the craziest thing. This illustrates yet another Rothbardian law that people specialize in the worst possible topics. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Mundell is great on rent control, minimum wage, unions, free trade, but he never discusses it. All he does is money, where he's horrible. Friedman, too. Friedman does two things, money and um, schooling. Well, he does a few other things, too. Um, uh, taxes, <laughs> negative income tax, and um, uh, withholding tax. He does a few things. But all the things he does, with some exceptions, he's horrible on. Whereas the, the stuff he's good on, well, he does a few, but he doesn't really too much. In conclusion, it is possible to make excuses for Friedman and Mundell. They're orthodox economists. What do you expect? <laughs> They're not Austrians. They can't help themselves. <laughs> Possibly they never even heard of Mises, although Friedman knew Mises. Mises called him a socialist. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but thanks to the Mises Institute, things are now changing. When I was in school, people, you know, like, I never heard of Mises in until I got my PhD. Nowadays, I think what Lou Rockwell and others are doing, at least people hear of this. They hear of the gold standard. Maybe I'm 
I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm fooling myself, but I tell you, when I first started, if I didn't know you, you weren't a libertarian or an Austrian, and now there are tens of thousands of people that I don't know about that are. So we're making some progress. Gold is not a barbarous relic. Gold is free market money, and I think on that I'll end.